Last year, the Centre for Independent Studies brought out to Australia the prominent British liberal writer, David Goodhart. Uh, Goodhart came to our annual concilium, uh, which is held at Byron Bay every year in August. Uh, and if you ever get an invitation and you can afford it, please go. It's always a very intellectually stimulating few days. And Goodhart was one of our special international guests at our annual concilium. Now, Goodhart, some of you may be familiar, uh, wrote a very prominent book in 2017 called The Road to Somewhere. And it dealt primarily with the 2016 Brexit vote. Uh, and his argument had more to do with outlooks and attitudes than it did with simple economics. And according to Goodhart, quote, the old distinctions of class and economic interest have not disappeared but are increasingly overlaid by a larger and looser one between the people who see the world from anywhere and the people who see it from somewhere. And for Goodhart, anywheres are university educated, cosmopolitan, highly mobile and socially liberal, whereas somewheres derive their identity from the particular places. They lack impressive educational backgrounds and they find social and cultural change unsettling. Somewheres, according to Goodhart, feel that globalisation has overreached. They feel ignored by the elites, indeed, to use an ugly expression, condescended to by the elites. They feel that politics was running away from them. And if you think about it, it's fair to say that in America, this sense of anxiety contributed to the rise of Donald Trump in 2016. It's contributed to the rising tide of populism and nativism across the European continent. And it has self-evidently helped lead to the Brexit vote three years ago. However, Brexit has not quite worked out as many people had anticipated. After nearly three years since the vote to leave the European Union, Britain remains part of the European Union and indeed later this month will be participating in the European parliamentary elections, which has led some pundits to describe the EU as a bit like Hotel California, where you can check out but you never leave. <laughs> Meanwhile, Theresa May uh, is bleeding authority and credibility as if from an open wound. The Conservative Party, which of course has produced many of Britain's great Prime Ministers, most notably Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher, that party has resembled nothing so much as a pub brawl. Everyone, however grand or obscure, has felt entitled to join in and there's talk is now rife that the Tory party is on the verge of splintering. Suddenly, the prospect of a socialist, Jeremy Corbyn, in number 10, is not a remote prospect. As for the British public, their trust in Westminster has dissipated dramatically since the 54, sorry, 52 48 vote to leave Brussels in June of 2016. Well, today we have a terrific panel to discuss these issues. Uh, first, Tim Montgomery. Tim is a leading British conservative Brexiteer. He's founder of Conservative Home, it's a centre right political blog in the UK. He's a former editorial page editor at the London Times in London. And uh, he is a guest this week of the Centre for Independence, thanks to the support of many of our uh, supporters here at CIS. I won't name them, but some of them are here and we appreciate that very much. Please welcome Tim Montgomery. <laughs> Just sit in the middle, mate. And our next speaker is, uh, uh, sorry, panellist is Alexander Downer. Alexander was foreign minister in the government of Prime Minister John Howard. Uh, I was at a function yesterday. Someone said he was our longest serving pr uh, foreign minister for 11 years. Well, in fact, I like to think it was actually 12 years because it was early 96 <laughs> to the end of 2007. Alexander, of course, has also been a federal Liberal MP uh, from 1984 through to 2008. Uh, and from 2014 to 2018, he like his father before him, was the High Commissioner to London. These days, he divides his time in London between Policy Exchange, that's a leading centre-right think tank, where Alex is the chairman, as well as the International School of Government at King's College London, where he is the executive chairman. Please welcome Alexander Downer. 
Now, Tim, I, I mentioned the Goodhart thesis, but nevertheless, people are still confused as to how Brexit happened. I'll never forget in May 2015, uh, the general election, which David Cameron won, a majority, not many, not many people expected that. And on my radio show at, uh, at the ABC's Radio National, I interviewed a friend of ours, Fraser Nelson, the mm. long-time editor of The London Spectator. And I'll never forget asking Fraser, what about the prospects of a uh, British vote that leaves European Union? He said, no way, no way in hell. Mm -hmm. It's just entirely inconceivable. Fraser, in fairness, was reflecting the orthodoxy. How do you account for Brexit a year later? Well, th thank you very much, Tom, first of all, for inviting um, me. And um, I don't really know actually why you have invited me, because <laughs> I was exactly as inaccurate as Fraser was <laughs> <laughs> on that issue. In fact, um, I, over the last few years, I said David Cameron wouldn't win that majority. I said that Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't become Labour leader, <laughs> that Donald Trump wouldn't even win the Republican nomination, let alone uh, become president, and that Brexit wouldn't happen. So you've got a real expert in front of you uh, today so and probably you... should leave now. <laughs> so you think Bill Shorten will win the election? <laughs> <laughs> and I've, uh, I've got some tips for some racing uh, horses, if you want them from me as, a, as well. But um, uh, anyway, I just... But of course, the, the, I partly mentioned that... Um, uh, because uh, the, 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 point, the question you raise is, uh, I think my predictions in normal times probably would have held good, or, or, or most of them, but we are living in an extraordinary time, and I don't think you can understand Brexit out of the context of what is happening around the world. And um, I supported Brexit, I, I still support Brexit. For me, it's a decision that is very painful, more painful than I thought it would be. The divorce is turning out to be more complicated than I anticipated. But for me, escaping uh, what I think is a dysfunctional organisation, you, when you have 27 member states all on different political and economic cycles, then making decisions in a world that requires you to be nimble is going to be increasingly difficult, and so I'm glad that we're out of it. But the, 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 the thing that I think is so... Uh, d depressing at the moment and, uh, and disappointing is, of course, a lot of Brits didn't vote uh, for Brexit because of uh, sovereignty reasons. They voted because, like many people around the world, they're voting against what they think is a bad economic deal that, that, that they're getting. Mm -hmm. They wanted a reset of public policy. And partly because Brexit is an all-consuming task, but also because we're led by the worst prime minister of the post-war period um, at the moment um, in the UK. Um, what hasn't happened is Britain hasn't found an ability or to address why those underlying causes mm. of this issue. So, yes, we're in the mess uh, of, of the Brexit divorce, but we're also in the mess of actually not addressing the underlying causes of why people voted that way now, as well. Now, Alex, you were the High Commissioner for that during that vote in uh, June 2016. You cannot speak out in a private capacity because of your position, but what was your sense about Brexit back uh, three years ago? So like Tim, I thought that uh, Remain would win and the reason I thought Remain would win wasn't that, uh, that the British people didn't want to leave the EU. I thought an awful lot of them did and I'll come to why. Um, but because they, um, you know, were naturally cautious and thought, gosh, you know, it would be a disruption and maybe we better not do it. And the government ran, um, the then government, the um, David Cameron government ran a massive scare campaign mm. Um, Project Fear, it was called, um, about how the economy would collapse, and you know, a percentage of people clearly believed that, and and they might have instinctively wanted to leave, but they thought they'd better vote <coughs> Remain. So the first thing I thought was um, that the majority would, and they didn't. Though I did get Cameron winning the election outright, right, mm. and I got the Donald Trump election right. Mm. I look forward to seeing. Um, Scott Morrison remaining there for <laughs> a few more years. This you might think is wishful thinking. Well, there's nothing wrong with wishful thinking. Um, I, my analysis actually is sort of similar to Tim's but slightly different. I think um, what is happening, um, you particularly in Europe, with this rise of um, is sometimes called populism or nativism is an expression that's come out of American, which is, is a particularly pejorative expression, apparently, um, but is actually nationalism. Um, and the irony of globalization is it's great for the economy, free trade, free flow of investment and so on, um, and free movement of people. But um, 
it challenges people's sense of national identity. Um, and I think particularly in continental Europe with this huge flood of irregular migration, that has been very confronting to people who feel their national identity. You know what I mean by their, their sense of their nation and the values of their nation and the traditions and so on as being overwhelmed by people from other cultures. Um, and I think in the UK, this sort of notion was really important to people. Um, and, um, you know, they're proud to be British. And um, the idea that Britain should become a province, a mere province of a supranational Europe, um, a supranational organisation run by somebody like Juncker, um, it's, you know, it's a bloody hard sell, that. Um, so I can understand. I mean, and I think, I think the left, have been very strong on this line that people, some people have been dispossessed by globalisation, um, you know, that the, there's been a growing inequality in society and so on. Well, in the case of the UK, there hasn't actually been. There isn't data that supports that proposition. Um, and I'm not sure that they've been dispossessed. I think they're just proud to be British and they don't want to be subsumed. And I think when you're looking at what's happening in many countries, Western countries, um, it's a huge mistake to underestimate the importance of this issue mm -hmm. of national identity and pride in our nation mm -hmm. and pride in our way of life. And political leaders who aren't able to, res like Theresa May, who aren't able to capture that mm -hmm. sense of nationhood and that sense of a nation's culture and pride in itself, if they can't do that, they're not going to last very long. And it's fair to say, Tim, that uh, these divisions go beyond the ideological left and right. So yeah. if you look at the Labor Party, although most Labor MPs and the Commons support Remain, something like seven out of ten Labor constituencies, particularly in Northern England, mm. supported Leave. And in the Tory party, of course, you have the, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, her predecessor, David Cameron, mm. uh, her Chancellor, uh, Hammond. Yeah. They, support, they supported Remaining. But the Tory grassroots supported uh, leaving. How do you yeah. account for this? It's, 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 it, because of the I, I, I've, uh, everything that Alex just said, I, I, I agree with. It's um, th th there are complicated beyond right and left explanations of why we are in this position. Um, it is about ideas of nationhood. It is about concerns about inequality. It is a concern about uh, the, the pace of change and technology. And this means different people in different of the old sides of the political divide mm. will we'll come to different con conclusions and it is potentially realigning you know it really could as you said in your introductory remarks tom it could break open the british political system and you, you uh, opinion pollsters in britain find now that uh people identify much more strongly as a brexiteer or a lever than they do about as a conservative or labor wow three times as strongly so, and you're one of them too, aren't you? Yeah. So I um I've been a concerted supporter all my life. Tomorrow night here I'm speaking about Margaret Thatcher. Had a picture of Margaret Thatcher on my student wall. You know I was a I'm a <laughs> real a sad man. Tory. <laughs> man. <laughs> um, but for the first time ever in my life at the European elections, because I'm, a, I'm I regarded offensive that three years after yeah. we voted to leave the European Union, we were participating in European elections. And that's in late May. Yeah, twenty uh, second of May, I think. Um, uh, I'm going to be voting for the Brexit party, the mm. party that Nigel Farage um, has set up, the offshoot of, of UKIP. And that's a big decision for you know, someone like me. But there's polling that says 40% of Conservative councillors are going to vote for the Brexit party. Councillors, elected Conservative um, yeah, officials. Let's be clear, this is yeah. very significant because yeah. unlike in Australia, it's first past the post voting in Britain, which means that the Conservative vote could be really decimated and by the rise of Brexit. This is the European Brexit. Parliament The European election. That's different. Yeah, okay, by proportional but you could say that about a general election, which could easily be held this year, correct? That, 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 that's right, yeah. And, um, so in so other words, Brexit represents a real threat to the Tory, not just its majorities in the Commons, but the Tory party as a whole. Yeah, and um, I wrote a piece straight after the last general election. There's, you could have, a, if we were here for the rest of the afternoon, we could go through listing the make mistakes that Theresa May has made um, <laughs> since she became prime minister. But right up there was the conduct of 
um, the general election campaign um, that we had in 2017. It was, uh, it was electoral malpractice on every <laughs> level, I think. Um, uh, Although, uh, mind you, the conventional wisdom was that she would win a landslide, correct? Yeah, but I, I think we, we saw in how she conducted that election just an inability to yeah. communicate or persuade that... And we should have got rid of her as a party straight after then. The idea mm. that a person who could uh, f uh, lose a, a majority that she inherited that couldn't communicate with um, voters, that didn't trust her cabinet so that they only found out what was in the party's manifesto on the bus to the manifesto launch. Yep. The idea that she could, could conduct the most important negotiations in Britain's post-war history <laughs> was crazy. And yet we entrusted her with that. And that is why we're in such a deep hole okay, politically now. The, now. the original deadline was late March. They pushed it back to mid-April. Now it's October 31, which happens to be Halloween. That's the deadline. <laughs> um, Alex, uh, three times this year, she has the Prime Minister has tried to get her soft Brexit version through the Commons. So this is a deal where uh, Britain leaves the European Union, but it's still part of the common market, correct? That's, that's the, the Customs right. Union. Cu customs yeah. Union, sorry. The Customs Union. Um, what are her chances now of getting this through the Commons before October 31? Well, um, first of all, first of all um, uh, Good luck a, with big, this question. A, big, <laughs> a, big, a big chunk of the Conservative MPs, and by the way, 80% of members of the Conservative Party, not MPs, 80% of the membership, Support Brexit, Jeez, whereas it's about the same supporting Remain in the Labour Party. So when you say 70% of Labour constituencies voted um, to leave the EU, but the Labour voters didn't. Uh -huh. Labour voters are mainly supporters of Remain. Um, so um, it, it's, uh, this is a huge problem for the Conservative Party because the membership wants to leave the EU for some of the reasons I described, actually. They tend to be a bit more on the sort of patriotic side, Conservatives. Um, and, um, but the MPs, a lot of the MPs don't want to. Mm. The Conservative MPs don't want to. So, look, you have a situation where the parliamentary parties divided the... Um, European Research Group, the really passionate Brexiteers, Is won't support the May plan. Rhys Mogg's group. Right? Rhys Mogg's yep. group. They won't support the May plan. Some of them, on the third vote of the, on the May plan, decided they'd go along with it because they feared the UK would never leave the EU if the May plan didn't get up. But uh, 50, whatever, six or so of them didn't, and so it, it founded. Um, there's no point in her putting that back to the parliament again. That's not going to get through. May, um, I mean, this this is really like completely mad. I think she's she's. I'm sort of with Tim. She really is an incredibly poor tactician, and has no capacity to communicate with the public, or her own MPs at all. And as a leader, you have to generate some emotion in your community. She's mm. just just without it, um, at least publicly. Um, so um, she has gone off and started negotiations with the Labour mm. Party. Now, by the way, this is gold for the Labour Party, this whole issue. The Tory party is split. You've just been talking about how their vote is plummeting. A lot of Conservatives are going over to support the Brexit party because of their disgust at the way May has been handling this. And her solution to this problem is to negotiate with the Labour Party. Yeah. And the Labour Party, oh, yeah, sure, we'll have these negotiations. Sure, 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 sure. Do you think the Labour Party is going to support a Tory Brexit? I mean, of course they're not. Of course they're not. The Labour Party is going to play this for as long as it can and it's going to say at the end of the day, OK, Prime Minister, we will go along with your proposal, but on one condition that you put it to another referendum. Ooh, and, second referendum. And this will, this will be toxic to the Conservative Party. OK. So but, she has got herself into an absolutely so, impossible position from which the Conservative Party can only extricate itself by doing okay. one thing, and that is getting a new leader. Yeah. Tim. Um, well, I certainly agree with we need a new leader. We need a new, new leader yesterday. Um, but um, on the on the question of a second referendum, um, 
the Conservative Party in Parliament isn't united on many things, but it is largely united against a second referendum. Um, because I think it knows that what is uh, possibly a salvageable situation at the moment with people like me defecting to the Brexit party would become probably a defining issue of breakdown in trust if they went for a second referendum. David, and the, the, the videos, you can easily find them on YouTube. All of the political leaders were absolutely clear. This is a once in a generation decision. Um, you vote to leave the European Union, we will implement your decision. It will not be reversed. There will not be a second referendum. All of the, the party leaders said this because they didn't expect to lose it. Mm, yeah. um, and what did the voters do? They believed them. <laughs> they believed Silly them. <laughs> Silly them. And um, I went on the, you know, it was part of the reason why I made my decision to um, support um, the Brexit candidate in my, in, in my region. And by the way, the leading Brexit candidate in my region is someone called Anne Widdicombe, a lifelong <laughs> Conservative. She was a Conservative MP. She was a Conservative member for 57 years. And she has gone to join the Brexit party in mm. absolute disgust at what um, has happened. So I went uh, campaigning for local elections uh, just before I came out here. And people are saying, um, I will never, ever vote for your party. I'll never vote again. I'm sick to death and of, of, of who of who represents. If we were to say we're not going to implement your decision, um, there will be fury. And you know, Britain is a, a patriotic nation, and we have seen in previous times where Denmark and Ireland have voted mm. against a European treaty. Um, they've been basically forced to vote again until they voted until they the get correct it right. way. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I think there was a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of sense in, but, we don't do that in Britain. We have made our decision and you won't bully us into reversing it. And it will be humiliating and it would be a, um, it would be a really bad day for trust in democracy if that decision is okay, but not whatever all, the outcome. Not, a, not all British uh, Tory Brexiteers uh, would agree with that analysis. Peter, Peter O'Born, the long time, a political correspondent in Westminster, uh, formerly with the Daily Telegraph and now with the Daily Mail. He's mm -hmm. written a lot for The Spectator over the years. He has done a U-turn and has said that he regrets supporting Brexit and now supports Britain remaining part of uh, the European Union. And he makes the point that, um, quote, uh, Britain's trade with the EU far exceeds its trade with either the US or China. Um, and there are understandable concerns that a hard Brexit would mean steep tariffs and other controls that could sap investment oh, and send Britain into, into recession. And, and, and in fairness to Oborn, he says, already you've got companies like Airbus, Jaguar, Land Rover, Philips, among others, they've all announced that they will scale back investments in Britain. Add to this, this is the Wall Street Journal, officials at the port of Dover, quote, estimate that for every two minutes of delay trucks experienced before embarking on cross-channel ferries, a 17-mile traffic backup will be created on the M20 highway heading to the port. So uh, surely grounds for real concern there, Tim. Um, well, one thing I'd say is Peter Oborn is indeed, as you described, a respected commentator, but he's almost exceptional. Almost no one in the, uh, in, in the commenting class, if that's a way of describing them, has moved. And it is one yeah. of the most remarkable features, actually, of... Uh, the three years since the referendum. Public opinion is remarkably stable. You know, if, if anything, people are feeling more convinced on both sides um, of, their, of their view. And, and that's because the underlying facts of you know, the debate haven't, haven't changed. You, and you know, to be trying to do justice to both sides, you have the leavers who basically see this dysfunctional European Union, and they think, yes, divorce is going to be messy, but the long term to be in charge of our own destiny free from that dysfunctional organisation mm. is going to be worth it. And that contrasts with a lot in the Westminster political class, you know, who th they live on a 24 seven, you know, cycle, they can only really see the next morning's newspapers. Whereas the British people think, you know, like, did you have the expression in uh, Australia that a dog is for life, not just for Christmas? Um, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> we, uh, 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 Brexit is forever for people, you know, and they're willing to go through some pain. You know, they, this yeah. is a long term. And on the other side, which is germane to what uh, Peter Oborn said, there's a belief that 
Britain is a second order nation now, that we're a middle ranking power, that we our best years are behind us and that we need to be part of a economic trade area, an economic block where the world is increasingly dividing into economic blocks. Now, I think both of those positions are, are somewhat respectable, yes. but they aren't influenced by uh, short term developments. And I think the counter to what Peter O'Born says is if you look at which is the strongest major economy in Europe at the moment, it's Britain. You know, it's growing. Britain is growing faster mm. than Germany, Italy, France and Spain. Now, we're supposedly the country that's, you know, weighed down by Brexit. But actually, for me, the UK, partly because of the reforms, largely because of the reforms that Margaret Thatcher introduced with flexible labour market, we are a strong economy and we're going to be OK. Once we're through this divorce, a wall of money, I think, will come in once the investor blight is lifted. So some of the practical problems and issues that Peter Oborn and others mm. raised, which are completely foreseeable, are real. <laughs> Okay. But they are exaggerated. But the as EU well. is a is a big block with serious clout. Alex, this is Jonathan Friedland, who's one of the more sober columnists with the Guardian in London. He says, <laughs> yes. uh, oh, "Very he says, sober." Uh, we'll know, but I'll, just keep you on your toes. Mate. We don't like it. I mean, what is it about conservatives that they quote the left? <laughs> no, no, I'm just keeping you on your toes, mate. <laughs> Why don't and, <laughs> this is the EU and equal across the table when it faces the world's two big other economic oh, superpowers, yeah, sure. China and the US. So this is what uh, this is what Friedland says, and I think this is what Oborn would say. "Quote: When Britain comes to negotiate a trade deal with Donald Trump, we'll get eaten for breakfast with a side dish of chlorinated chicken." But in the EU, Washington or Beijing meet their match. How would you respond to that? I mean, it's just incredible, I think, <laughs> that sort of stuff. Um, I don't know where to start. I'll start with the, um, with the Americans um, cleaning up the UK in a free trade negotiation. What does that ever, whatever could that mean? So Australia's economy is uh, less than half, around half, slightly less than half the size of the UK's economy and our population isn't much more than a third. Um, we have a free trade agreement with the United States and I was part of the negotiations. They didn't, um, whatever, have us for lunch, whatever the expression is. Um, I thought we got a fantastic deal, which means, which means we're able to import things from the United States much more cheaply than we were able to before and we're able to export more readily and more cheaply to the United States. I don't know, since we signed that free trade agreement, that was one of the achievements of, remember, the Howard government? <laughs> um, exactly. Um, well, well, um, so ruthlessly disposed of with such, a, with such uh, great results. Um, the, um, um, since, the, since we concluded that free trade agreement, our trade with the United States has grown by about 70%. Uh, so the UK, with um, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, a nuclear weapons state, the fifth biggest economy in the world, um, it would do worse than us, would it, in negotiating a free trade agreement with the United States, which is reduced to a childish comment about chlorinated chicken. <laughs> by the way, by the way, uh, it's not compulsory for people to eat chicken which has been washed in chlorine. <laughs> Although if you buy broccoli at Waitrose or at Safeways, they're supermarkets in England, if you buy broccoli there, it's chlorinated. It's been cleaned in chlorine. I mean, it's pathetic, that kind of argument. It's why you shouldn't read The Guardian. Okay, now the guy. <laughs> um, and if you're, you're reading this stuff. Now the conventional... Uh, and, and, yep. and, and, no, I want, to say, I want to make one other point. I really do. I want to make one other point, because I was the foreign minister of this country for nearly 12 years, as you say. And That's I spent right. a lot of time dealing with the EU... And a more arrogant organisation, I promise you, um, I have never dealt with than the, Euro than the institutions of the European <laughs> Union, the presidency of the Council and the, um, the presidency of the Commission and all these people. Gosh, they used to look down their long noses at us. Um, but I'll tell you something, they punch in this world way below their weight. <coughs> And the European Union carries nothing like the weight of the United States and China. To compare the European Union to the United States and China is absurd. You've got, well, 28 going down with a bit of luck to 27 <laughs> countries um, and sinking all the time. Um, 27, 27 countries uh, trying to put together a position, a common position, means that it is reduced to the lowest common denominator. 
um, and makes them very, very, very weak negotiators, not strong negotiators like China and America. That's ridiculous. Tim, comparison. I've just got to say this because I love this man. <laughs> I love this man. And I say, he was an absolutely superb High Commissioner from oh, your country you. to Britain. And we really miss you. <laughs> <laughs> we really, I really miss Alex on the airways because um, I think you were a little bit skeptical about whether we should have voted to leave at the beginning. Mm, I think sure. that's fair to say. Yeah, but no, once a decision was taken, you were on the airways talking about the opportunities that Britain had for a free trade area with the, with the likes of your great country and just talking about the opportunities that Britain had and my goodness if only other MPs uh, who were remain supporters that took the same attitude because unfortunately at the root of the problem with the Brexit negotiations is at the top of the tree with in Theresa May we have a remainer who sees Brexit as a risk minimization exercise damage limitation and she doesn't see the opportunities like in free trade outside of the, the customs union. There's no real belief that Britain has taken a big decision and let's look at the opportunities. It's let, let's limit the damage. So Alexander Downer for British Prime Minister is going to be uh, <laughs> my new slogan. We'll, we'll take questions very soon, but on the point about damage and damaged goods, the overwhelming consensus is that May is indeed damaged goods. Mm. How does the uh, Conservative Party um, dislodge her and who's the most likely candidate to replace her? Um, well, without getting into too much of the sort of basically the boring rules um, of it all, is that t the Tory party challenged her leadership last uh, December, and the rules of the backbench committee that governs these things is you can't have another challenge for 12 months. They're trying to change those rules at the moment, but um, <laughs> it's a bit difficult when your uh, major campaign on the Brexit thing is not, you can't have a second referendum because the decision's been taken to start opening up other uh, d decisions. But um, uh, if you remember, those of you of a certain age will remember that Margaret Thatcher was ultimately got rid of by the cabinet. It was the cabinet <coughs> that basically said, we will resign in large numbers if you carry on. In late 1990. In, in 1990. And at the moment, it, um, my anger isn't so much directed with Theresa May. Her uselessness is absolutely established beyond all doubt in my <laughs> mind. Um, the, the feebleness of the cabinet and not really um, uh, acting against her. So... Actually, a big day is um, only a few days ago. We've got the local elections in Britain on Thursday yeah. where the Tories may lose a 1,000 council seats. which would be. And if cabinet ministers don't soon after that say it's time for you to go um, and force her out, because she has no, Alex is right, she has no chance of getting her deal through, then I really am going to be, might be applying for asylum here. If um, <laughs> anyone here can support my application. Um, but but um, quickly, who's the race, likely to replace her, though? Boris. Why is that? Boris Johnson will be the next leader of the Conservative Party. Remember my record of predictions. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Boris is going to be the next um, Tory leader because the lower the Tories go, and we're at 14, 15 percent in some opinion polls yes. at the moment, still using we. Um, the more Boris, which a lot of MPC, as a, he, they see him as a risk. Yes. But when you're at 14, 15 percent, you need to take risks, and I think they'll roll the Boris dice. And, and for Boris that reason. resonates with the grassroots in a way that no other uh, Conservative MP does, correct? Yeah, and, I, yeah. and I, I spent a year in America, 2016, for the Times covering Trump v. Clinton. And I've got a poster on my wall of um, Donald Trump. Oh, I've got these politi the posters, all these posters <laughs> on my wall. But I have it, not because I'm a great Trump admirer, but it's just right behind him, a bank of people are just smiling and laughing. And, and that's what Donald Trump did. You know, he entertains people. people. A lot of people warm to him. And that's what Boris Gift is. In a time when all politicians are seen as the same, they don't communicate in a way that connects. Boris, you know, you stay in the room when he's on TV mm. because, you know, yeah. he, he, he captivates you. And I personally will be back in Sajid Javid, the Home Secretary, because I was at university with him. It's a loyalty and friendship thing. But Boris is the one, I think, that is potentially the game changer. And I think he's the one that a, a party in despair will, will vote for. Alex, quick thoughts on Boris Johnson. Yes, well, I um, I think he's a, a great, colourful personality, and actually, um, as an Australian who is not going to become the Prime Minister of Great Britain, <laughs> um, um, as an Australian, um, I can tell you he loves this country, and he's lived here for a while. Um, is it Melbourne taught, University? Taught at, no, taught Monash. Monash, 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 Monash and uh, Geelong Grammar. Okay. Sure. So he, um, but he has great affection for Australia. I was at. Um, at a dinner, at the, some of you might have been there at the Sydney Town, you I think were, at the Sydney Town Hall 
um, the year before last yeah, when Lowe Boris, Institute, yeah. Boris, um, yeah, the Lowy Institute, um, Boris made a speech. And, um, you know, if you forensically examine every point made in that speech, it may have fallen slightly short. <laughs> um, but um, but it was a it was a hugely entertaining Lovely speech, well very it. funny, um, and and here is a point I always make about leaders. You know, people um, uh, people ask, well, what is leadership? It's all sorts of things. Um, but one thing a leader has to do is make the um, chimes ring in the hearts of the people, as Ronald Reagan would say, generate a bit of emotion and affection. Um, which, of course, Theresa May is utterly bereft of. Mm. And, and Boris is, you know, he's very charismatic and he does generate that sort of emotion and affection in the public. So in that sense, I don't know whether he will definitely get it, but in that sense, um, <clears throat> um, he uh, is very effective. Okay, now it's time for Q&A. And our first question comes from Jason Collins. He's the CEO of the Europe Australia Business Council. Jason. Yeah, thanks very much, Tom, and thank you to, to the panel. Um, the question, uh, Australia obviously has great economic um, interests uh, in both Europe and the UK directly. A huge amount of the Australia-Europe relationship, of course, is, is the UK as a support of exports and also investment. The question is, um, in relation to if there is a change of leader and you have a much more committed Brexit-oriented uh, leader, I can only see one of two things happening. Either Brussels backs down on the on the backstop um, or else we move to a, to a no-deal arrangement. And um, personally, I've always thought the no-deal scenario was the most likely outcome, given all of the problems that you've said. However, when it comes to business, I think overwhelmingly it would be fair to characterise the, the view is that a no deal should be avoided at all costs because of the potential for massive economic disruption. But um, from the from the, the views that you've uh, presented, it doesn't seem you share that sort of same mm. concern that the dislocation to the economy will be that great. Um, could you perhaps elaborate on that and the, what I just proposed, that it's either a Brussels back, backs down or it's a no deal? Do you see that also as being the likely scenarios? Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, well, um, I think we could easily survive no deal with sufficient preparation. Um, uh, but the, the, the problem is it, it isn't just Theresa May who's a Remainer who doesn't sort of share the sort of this is a great opportunity uh, for the UK. The Chancellor of the Exchequer um, is even worse, if you can imagine that. Um, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, is even more sort of risk averse. And so the, the whole machinery of government has not been willing really to contemplate um, no deal. Um, and so um, we are unprepared, I think, for that eventuality or inadequately prepared for that eventuality. And I think unless there is a general election and the arithmetic in Parliament changes quite dramatically, Parliament will not vote for no deal. Um, and so uh, as much as some of us might think that it's, um, it, it's something we could embrace or should embrace, I think we have to recognise the numbers just aren't there at the moment. And so it was one reason why I would have been willing to vote for Theresa May's deal, because my concern is that um, if we don't legally leave the European Union, um, there is always a danger as time goes on, people's you know, support for the project will be eroded. And I think it's easier to sort of I, I, I put it this way, I think uh, a lot of us used to think of leaving the European Union as an event. And I think we probably now need to think of it as a process. And we were in the European Union for over four decades, and we became very enmeshed in the European Union. And I think it may be that we will have to leave now in two or three stages. And um, that represents a big confidence problem for some leavers, because I think that, that that's just a, a coded way of keeping us in, which is why I think someone like Boris Johnson is probably the only person who people will have confidence in to then supervise that that process of leaving. We're running out of time, so quickly. Philip Wood, next question. Um, <clears throat> speaking, um, can I just ask you what we should have done, admittedly with the benefit of hindsight, in terms of a strategy for leaving the EU? Now, speaking of Boris Johnson, apparently he was recorded in a private function saying that we should have engaged Donald Trump to do this for us. <laughs> and, and immediately on, on invo invoking Article 50, uh, two years in advance of actually leaving, Trump would have gone up to, the, to Juncker and said, 
We're leaving. There are no conditions at all. It's a no deal exit Brexit. But if you gentlemen and ladies of the European Union have any specific requests of us, yeah, by exactly. all means, come and attend, yep. attend to us. We'll impose exactly. no tariffs on European goods. Exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll in, accept all of the standards of equipment and so on in, in Europe. But we are leaving. You mm. have a £12 billion pound per annum yeah. surplus with our economy. So it's in your interest to do a deal with us. See mm. you in two years' time. Alexander yeah. Downer. Uh, yes, um, I- exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what May should have done. And one other thing. Um, the the card that the U, the best card the UK had to play in those negotiations was actually that the UK is the second biggest net contributor to the EU budget, and you know what the EU said? It's they would. I mean, I'm not criticising them for this. I think they've handled the negotiations from their point of view very well. Mm. They said, well, we won't talk about the trade arrangements um, until we settle your bills. And May said, oh, OK, well, we'll settle the bill. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding? Are you kidding? She gave away the best card that Britain had in the negotiations and then sat down and started talking about trade and got locked into this backstop malarkey. Um, so, I mean, personally, I mean, my greatest criticism of her is the utterly catastrophic tactics that she's pursued in these negotiations. Now, somebody won't say who it is, somebody we both know who's very close to her, told me the other day that she doesn't like to get into arguments and she didn't want to have a big argument with the Politics. European Union. And she thought if she was nice to them and held out um, an olive branch to them mm. that they'd give her a better deal. I mean, are you kidding? Um, I mean, I've dealt with many countries over many years. I never came across yeah. that country. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, Andrew Lowe. One... Um one, one issue with, um, with, with, with Brexit, uh, and one of the reasons that we are in a mess is obviously the, the constitu- UK doesn't have a constitution in the way that Australia does, and you know, there's implications of that around um, the lack of specificity about what you're actually voting for. But the other implication is that you've got big parts of the country, Scotland, Northern Ireland, London, etc., which voted the other way. How, how do those second order effects play out? I mean, there is talk about, um, you know, Nicola Sturgeon's now um, saying that uh, if, if Britain leaves the, uh, uh, leaves the EU, then uh, that, that suggests that there should be a second referendum in Scotland. There is some talk about, uh, um, you know, United Ireland and so on. How do you think those things play out uh, as second order effects? Yeah, well, I think the longer the paralysis goes on, there's, there's, more, there's, there's more danger of Great. that. And I think... Uh, one of the, you know, we're going through our list of Theresa May mistakes. You know, when she became Prime Minister, um, she gave a brilliant speech. Some of you may have remembered it. And she said, we need to tackle the injustices of our time. My, you know, Conservative government will be dedicated to um, addressing some of the social uh, issues that underlay the Brexit vote. And then she went on to do nothing, you know, of any consequence or significance in terms of tackling those. Now, those sorts of actions and potentially would have reassured Scotland and other parts of the UK that didn't vote for leave that, OK, they didn't believe in this Brexit project, but other good things were happening in, in the country. But because Theresa May is a control freak, because she hasn't handled Brexit well, Brexit is the only debate, and therefore it's defining absolutely everything and increases the risk, like you say, of a separatist uh, vote in Scotland. OK, final question, Professor Bruce McKern. Sorry. Uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about Northern Ireland versus uh, uh, the Republic. Um, We're told that um, uh, trade between the Republic and Northern Ireland is only about 1% of Ireland's total export trade, some of which goes through the UK by truck and onwards. Um, And yet this has been brought up by the, particularly by the Republic, as a key issue for them. Can you tell us how that might get resolved? Um, <laughs> so, um, so the the um, the question here is whether um, there would be, in any circumstances, a hard border, the imposition of a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. And May has been sucked into. It's one of her mistakes. Um, <laughs> May has been sucked into this debate. By the way, which plays out quite strongly in the Republic, in the Doyle, in the Irish Parliament, 
where the um, government doesn't have an absolute majority. Um, so the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister there, is, is also in a precarious political situation. Um, so um, the argument goes um, that unless, there, unless the UK and Ireland remain in a customs union, in the customs union, the EU customs union, um, there is the potential for establishing a, a hard border um, because they could have differential tariff rates, the UK and, um, and Ireland, and possibly differential regulatory regimes as well, for example, for things like food safety and so on. Um, the trouble with this argument is that the British government has said, under no circumstances, whether we leave without a deal or whether we leave with, with a deal, but including if we leave without a deal, which as Tim says, the parliament won't allow to happen, but if we were to leave without a deal, um, we will not establish a hard border. We will find some technological solution. Um, and on the other side, the Taoiseach, the um, Prime Minister of Ireland, has said on a number of occasions, as is his foreign minister, that under no circumstances will the Republic of Ireland establish a hard border. So it leaves me to conclude, so what's this debate all about? Nobody's going to establish a hard border. I mean, the, what, the, the, the Eurocrats over there in Brussels are going to come along with, uh, you know, a hammer and nails and some planks of wood and barbed wire and build a hard border um, with a Taoiseach and the Prime Minister on either side of the border saying, tear down, Mr Juncker, tear down this wall. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure where, where this is leading. Um, okay. But this has been, I mean, honestly, um, the British government and the British Prime Minister has been sucked into this debate, something horrible, and it is the cause of um, uh, it is the cause of much of Theresa May's woe. Okay, now it's time for vote and th vote of thanks, and I'd like to call on my colleague Greg Lindsay to deliver the vote of thanks. I don't get to stand up here very much these days, so I'm going to say something extra. Um, Tom Tom mentioned at the start <clears throat> a little bit of the prehistory of CIS. And a significant event occurred earlier this month um, related to that uh, bit of prehistory, namely the philosopher Lachlan Chipman died. Uh, Lachlan ha was the first person I wrote to. I thought it was Anzac Day, but it was actually the 26th of uh, April 1976 about this idea I had to start a, th a centre, this one. And uh, he, I'd read a review that he'd written of uh, Robert Nozick's book, Anarchy, State and Utopia. And uh, uh, I wrote to him and told him this is what I had in mind. So he took the trouble. He was at the University of Wollongong. He was the foundation <laughs> professor of philosophy there. And he drove up to see me to talk about it. And he became a very active participant in our activities in those early days. And as time went on, he uh, got promoted, as one does, and uh, moved off, off into academic administration and retired after being a vice-chancellor in Queensland uh, to Bond University, actually, and he died um, just a few weeks ago. So that's a little bit of prehistory. Um, the, the unfortunate, I wish he'd lived a bit longer, but uh, we lost touch a little bit, but these things happen, so I thought I'd pass that on. Now, to Brexit. Boy, oh boy, what can we say about this? I've got a couple of friends who, who are, and most of you know them, who are running, um, running for the European elections. Uh, one, um, Dan Hannon. <laughs> I wrote to him when he said he was going to run again. I said, I tell you from the heart, this is an absolute bloody sodding nightmare. <laughs> the last thing I want to do is fight another election. But having thought about it long and hard, I concluded that not contesting would be tantamount to desertion in battle. <laughs> Tim advised him <laughs> not, to, not to run. Another friend um, is Claire Fox, who's got a slightly different um, intellectual history to Dan. She's a gun. She's coming out for us in, I hope, unless she wins. I don't know what happens <laughs> then. <laughs> She's coming out for us for Concilium this year in, in August. Um, she uh, announced in the last week or so that she was going to be running uh, for the European Parliament for the Brexit Party. Uh, she thought, she said, I didn't think I'd ever be on the same platform as Nigel Farage. And uh, if you want to go uh, and look on YouTube, just Google her and 
and Brexit Party, there's a little five-minute speech he gave, one of the best little speeches about politics and democracy. She's from, she's from the left, although sometimes a bit hard to sort of work that out. But anyway, that's what she says. So um, it's going to be a very interesting time. Australia's not a bit player in this. If you believe Dan Hannan, I mean, he's had a, uh, had a um, project to try and get uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and uh, the United States to sort of counter uh, as a trade thing, to tra uh, counter Europe and so on. So we'll see. I think today we've heard from people, two people who know one hell of a lot about a very complex issue, as, although in a way it sounds simple. We know that it's not so straightforward and, and time will tell. I mean, European elections are not far off. Uh, we'll see what happens then. Uh, please then do join with me in thanking both Tim and Alexander for giving wonderful presentations.